Hello, I'm Professor John Kelly and this is the Weber Auto YouTube channel. In this episode we will be exploring the high voltage battery from the original 2011 Nissan LEAF electric vehicle. Now this is one of the most controversial battery designs out there, mainly because of the lack of an active cooling system to remove the heat from the battery. But we will look at the individual pieces uh, and totally reassemble this battery uh, in this video. Now before we get doing that, I need to thank the good people at Green Tech Auto Hybrid Batteries. We would not have this battery to look at today if it, if it weren't for the folks at Green Tech Auto Hybrid Batteries. And what they do different from other companies is they have deals with salvage yards and, and wrecking yards here in the United States where they buy batteries, hybrid batteries and electric vehicle batteries from salvage yards from vehicles that have been in automobile accidents. And they take them apart, they test all the individual cells or cell modules and make sure that everything is in good shape. Uh, if there's bad parts, they will swap them out with good parts from other batteries they have obtained from other salvage yards. So if I was running a business that sold used hybrid and electric batteries, that's exactly how I would do it. Green Tech Auto Hybrid has been in business for over eight years, and they have 19 locations in North America. So check out their website. I put a link in the video description down below. So thank you to the, the people at Green Tech Auto Hybrid Batteries. All right, let's start looking at some of the parts. The biggest and most obvious pieces inside the Nissan Leaf battery are the battery modules. So this is one battery module right here and it has a positive terminal, a negative terminal, and a voltage sensing terminal. And inside of this are four lithium ion pouch cells, very similar to this Chevrolet Volt lithium ion battery pouch cell. So there are two sets of these, four of them, in two pairs of two. So two of these are welded together and then two more are welded together and then they are put in series, positive to negative, inside of one of these battery modules. Well, I'm not content with just having that be the, the smallest piece uh, that we look at in this battery uh, because there's, uh, there's got to be some interesting things to look at inside there. So I decided I, I want to open one of those battery modules up and and see how it's configured. I want to I want to look at it, but the the housing isn't made to be opened. And I got looking real close at it, and if you look real close right at the edge there, it actually looks like the edge of a can of tuna or uh, some other canned good. And so I thought, hey, I wonder if I can use a can opener to open that up. Now, don't do this at home, folks. <laughs> don't use the can opener to open it. But when my wife wasn't looking, I grabbed her uh, can opener and I used it on this battery module right here. And sure enough, I was able to cut from the top all the way down and around and back to open up one of these modules. Now I say don't do this at home because if you sh short circuit something in here, there's a big risk of fire. And uh, I just highly recommend that you do not even try that. I did it in an environment where it wouldn't hurt anything uh, unless I couldn't get out of the way fast enough. So let's open up a battery module of a Nissan LEAF. All right, now there's some information I put on the labels on the front of this battery module that apply to the rest of these battery modules and the whole battery uh, as a whole. Uh, first thing is the nominal voltage is 7.5 volts. And nominal means it's neither charged nor discharged. It's just that's its normal uh, voltage. There are 48 of these 7.5 volt modules inside of the Nissan LEAF battery. Uh, and that, if you take 48 times 7.5, you get 360 volts as the nominal voltage for the entire battery pack. All right, uh, this battery pack is rated for 24 kilowatt hours and 60 amp hours. So let's open this up and, and take a look inside. 
uh, as I take off the front cover, which was glued on, <laughs> this blue piece of material here, which I believe is a heat transfer material, has a real sticky, tacky adhesive right there. And it was all I could do to get this off without bending it. Um, it was it was rough. Um, okay, now I had to uh, manually cut the aluminum on the top to get the lid off. But now we can rock out the rest of it. Just like that. And of course the back side also was glued to the bottom of the module housing. And so I had to carefully take that off to see inside. Now if you look closely at the edge here, you can see that there are one, two, three, four of the lithium ion pouches. Now there's a top cover right here that comes off next. Just a little pocket screwdriver and some little tabs to release on each side. There we go. And I lift that up. So now here's the bottom view, which we still can't see very much. And then there's a top view where we can see some connections at the top here. This is only seven and a half volts. I don't need high voltage gloves. I don't need personal protective equipment. You still need to not let these two short out or touch something uh, conductive like the stainless steel top of my workbench here. You got to be real careful and be, be cautious of those even though it's uh, just seven and a half volts. All right, on the back side, there's another little cover plate to take off. Right there. And now we can see on the back some of the connections. Now I wanted to make some sense of these electrical connections. And as I said before, we have four of these lithium ion uh, cell pouches in here. So I wanted to open them up, but they're glued. Each one is glued to each other, I'm sure for heat transfer. And so I thought, well, I've come, come this far, let's, let's keep going. There's some little dowel pins that have to come out here that hold the support housings for the electrical connections. Uh, on all four of these pouches. So I have to take out two on the bottom and two on the top. Little dowel pins. Now with that, with those dowel pins taken out, I could see that I could get in and uh, try to separate it, which I, eventually I got it separated. But you can't separate it uh, without cutting the electrical connections right here on the top. So I cut between here and here and here and here on the one side so that I could open this up. So I'm going to open it now. It opens like this. So now I have two 3.75 volt pouches and notice this pouch in comparison with the Chevrolet Volt pouch is much larger and we would expect it to be. The Volt battery was a smaller uh, kilowatt hour battery, uh, 16 I believe, and this one's 24 kilowatt hour. So to make sense electrically of how these pouches are wired, as I showed you on the Chevrolet Volt pouch, there's a positive terminal and a negative terminal sticking up at the top of the pouch. So you can see right here 
one of the terminals coming up and it has a positive symbol on a sticker right there so that this pouch right here that's its positive terminal and it comes up and it is welded to this copper bus bar that then has the positive terminal from the front pouch welded together so that puts it in parallel same with the two negative terminals right there so these two lithium ion pouches are in parallel with each other but then coming off of the negative terminal we have a bus bar where i had to cut the connections from the other pair of cell pouches so they connect where i cut it it connects right here and that is the positive two terminals of this set of cells and the negative two terminals are over here so negative positive that positive connected to the negative of this other set of cells and then here's its positive so we have two sets of two parallel cell pouches in series with each other so two pouches in parallel with each other here two more pouches in parallel here and we just put the two in series with each other with this one common connection fold it back together to complete the cell module now I, I wanted to know what is this center screw here well that center screw on the front pouch just goes between the center screw and the positive terminal and the center screw connects to the negative terminal of the front pouch and so that will give us the cell pack voltage the parallel cell pack voltage of just two of the four of these uh, cell pouches then if you go between that same screw and the negative terminal through that uh, bus bar that I cut the connections on it gives us the voltage of the other set of parallel pouches so with just the center screw and the negative we measure the front two pouches and from the center screw to the positive we measure the rear two pouches on this module now there are two different part numbers of the module on the early leaves and the only difference between them is which side is positive and which is negative you can see on the positive side it has a red terminal negative side has a black terminal um, you've got to pay real close attention to how these came apart inside of the the battery itself so that you get your everything in series with each other positive negative positive negative positive negative uh, otherwise you'll uh, lose some of your power by putting positive to positive or negative to negative okay well uh, that was scary for me to uh, disassemble i was afraid i was going to short circuit something or catch something on fire but um, it uh, ended up being a good good experiment let me grab a module that has not been disassembled this one right here and let's take a measurement from the center terminal to the negative center terminal to the positive if i go from the center terminal to the positive terminal i read 3.794 volts if i go from the center terminal to the negative terminal i read 3.797 volts so three millivolts 0 0.003 volt difference between the two sets of parallel pouches inside of the battery module now there's a computer called the lithium ion battery controller on the end of the rear stack of battery modules and one of the jobs of that computer is to monitor these voltages and then try to balance them by keeping the voltages within a certain range we want these to be as equal as possible if you're ever going to go in and replace one of these modules or replace an entire stack of modules then you need to make sure that 
the voltage of the module you're putting in matches the voltage of the modules that are already there. Otherwise, it'll trigger a trouble code and may not even let the vehicle move at all. So I believe there's a scan tool function to draw down the power of a certain uh, cell module. Uh, and there's a, other ways to do it with uh, resistive load as well. But you, you've got to have these at the same voltage. I forgot to take one more measurement with this battery module while it's here. Just the, both cells, both parallel cells put in series uh, combined here. So we'll go from positive to negative. We get 7.59 volts on this cell right here. Now, according to the scan tool data, these can be the allowable range on the scan tool without triggering a trouble code is as high as 4.2 volts and as low as 3.2 volts. Okay, as I said before, there are three, one, two, three stacks of these modules where we just stack up modules. Uh, this particular stack goes on the right hand side of our empty battery housing over there. This one's our left hand stack and this one in the rear is called the rear stack. So the right hand stack is six kilowatt hour rating. The left hand st stack is six kilowatt hour and the rear stack is 12 kilowatt hour for a total of 24 uh, kilowatt hour. Now, as I showed you on those modules, each one has its own positive and negative terminal. Positive red, negative black. And these modules have to be put in a certain order so that as we connect positive to negative, positive to negative, we put everything in series to build up the total voltage of this. Uh, now, in this stack here, the right hand and the left hand stacks, there are 12 7.5 volt nominal uh, modules, which makes, makes this module be ni up to 90 volts uh, if it was totally connected together, which it is not right now. All the bus bars are removed. Uh, so the highest voltage that we have is the 7.5 volts uh, right here. So we've got 90 volts here, 90 volts here, that's 180. And then we have uh, 180 volts on the rear stack as well. So 180 plus 180 gives us 360 volts. Now, as you can see on the side of these battery modules, I've numbered each one of them. And if you're doing any service work on this battery, you need to know which module is which because there are up to five different trouble codes per set of parallel cells, which means up to 10 trouble codes per module. And if you get a trouble code for a certain module and you decide, well, I need to go in and replace just that module, which you can do. Uh, after downloading and purchasing hundreds of dollars worth of Nissan LEAF service information and training information, uh, the Nissan LEAF battery was originally designed and still is to be fully serviceable as far as going in and replacing any part that you want. Uh, I don't think it's had to have a lot of internal pieces replaced. The biggest problem has been the the battery's own capacity uh, decreasing and, and decreasing the drivable range of the vehicle. But the point I'm getting to here is the number or these modules are not numbered. And so there's this little map that I found in the training material uh, that shows, as you can see here, sort of where each battery module is. And so it took a little bit of it of figuring out and in, interpreting to, to find that. So if you look at this battery stack right here, the lowest battery module number is module 37 right here. And so we start at 37 and then go to 38, up to 39, over to 40, up to 41, over to 42, up to 43, over to 44. And then there's a connection that comes down over here to 45, 46, 47, and 48. So that's 12 modules in a unique order in which they need to be electrically connected together with the bus bars. Now the left-hand stack is laid out differently than the right-hand stack. They look identical, but which module is which, the order that the modules are uh, placed in series with each other is, is totally different. And then on this giant rear stack right here, 
module one is clear down there on the other side and it just simply goes two three four five six all the way through module 24 right here and then we pick up module 25 right here and that winds its way through up to module 36 which then connects to module 37 and then all the way through to module 48. Now on this battery um, module 48 is the overall battery negative that you'll see will connect uh, to the junction block the inside the battery that when turned on will send power to the inverter up underneath the hood. Uh, module number one down there on the rear stack is overall battery positive. And so we'll see that here in a little bit. So of course there are specific torque values for each one of these uh, module bolts. If I turn this module just a little bit here, I can take off, since I've already loosened the bolts, what's called an end bracket. So if I loosen this up, I can lift off an end bracket and then just lift up one module like this module 46 which is no different than the one we just looked at and every one of these modules are identical other than the polarity which is positive which is negative but the thing you need to know about assembling one of these is that there are spacers there's a module spacer in between each set of modules so that when you torque the bolts down it's not squishing the housings of the modules together it keeps a little bit of an air gap between it which I'm sure the intent was to uh, help cool the battery uh, help keep the battery cool uh, but as I mentioned at the start of this video there is no liquid cooling system there's no refrigerant type cooling system like some of the BMWs have uh, there's no air blowing through it uh, like Toyotas have there is nothing to keep this battery cool when you put the lid on that battery case that I showed you at the start of the video and bolt it down it's a hermetically sealed no air in or out uh, there are some vents for atmospheric pressure changes uh, as you drive up and down uh, uh, high elevation uh, mountains and so on but that does not allow airflow uh, through the system and, and so it's just a totally sealed box and no place for the heat to get out. Now, heat, you can transfer heat, if you remember, in, from basic physics, at least my basic physics, through conduction, where we physically touch some hotter, some item that's hotter to something that's cooler, and the heat transfers to the cooler item. There's convection, where something is really hot, and it heats the air up around it, and then the air dissipates the heat. And then there's radiation, uh, like the sunlight, where there's heat being transferred as long as you're not in a shadow. Well, the majority of the heat transfer through the, the Nissan LEAF battery is conduction to the outer housing and then convection to the air. And that's it, uh, which is unfortunate uh, for the the design as it's turned out to be if you especially if you live in very hot climates areas of the world where it's very hot uh, that's a problem for nissan leaf batteries if you leave live somewhere with temperate or, or cool temperatures cold temperatures then you're you're probably all right and haven't had any problems but i wanted to show you there is absolutely nothing here to remove heat except for just thermal conduction and, and convection all right, so there are two module spacers that have to be lined up with the holes. Then we just start stacking the modules on top of each other. Obviously, we stack four up over here. We're only stacking two up here. There's a warning in the service information about proper alignment of the modules themselves. And I'll show you what that, what they're talking about there. So if I put these bolts down in, 
and get them started by hand. There we go. These bolts are started by hand, but I can still twist these upper modules and they tell you don't put it together with it twisted. Uh, especially on this rear stack here. They want you to get a, a straight edge and put it along the modules before you tighten the bolts down that hold them all together in the stack to make sure that everything is aligned properly. Um, now disassembling these is, is easy. You just undo the bolts and take them out. But on this rear stack, it has big studs that go all the way from one side to the other. And you're laying these modules on their side. And so it could be a little harder to uh, get them aligned as you put it back together. They recommend that as you disassemble it and, and remove the nuts from the studs that go all the way through here, that you put a big uh, cinch strap around it to keep the modules from falling apart uh, whenever you're disassembling that. Because if they start, if they start to fall, especially if you're, you've got some sort of a conductive tabletop, which uh, you should not be using if you're going to be disassembling those uh, parts, some of the modules might fall and get somewhere where they could short out or cause other type of damage. So uh, we want these as straight as possible before we torque them down. And there is a specific torque for these. I found it interesting in the Nissan Leaf service manual, they don't give you the bolt torque for, <laughs> for these bolts. They just say torque the bolt. And so I looked in the service manual and tried to find torque specs, a whole section of specifications for torque. I couldn't find it. The only thing I could find was a, a table with general torque ratings for specific types of bolts. So if I just missed it, please write something in the comments down below, but I could not find the uh, torque specs in the service manual. However, in the instructor guide for the Nissan Leaf EV Technologies, um, both the 2014 version and the 2018 version, uh, it does give the uh, torque specifications, which I was relieved to find. And so the torque spec on these hold down bolts right here is not very much. Uh, 9.6 Newton meters or 85 inch pounds, not foot pounds, inch pounds. So that's between seven and eight foot pounds. So if you have an inch pound torque wrench, 85 inch pounds, let me grab mine. I'm going to snug these up by hand first. Okay, they just want you to use a cross pattern as you tighten these bolts down to specification. So we will go to 85. Now, if this was the end stack nuts that we're tightening up on the studs that go through, they want you to do it twice. They want you to check the bolt torque twice. Okay, so this is the outside of the vehicle view of these modules. But now let's take a look at the electrical side, the inside view. So now we can see all of the terminals sticking out of the modules. So we've got a negative and then the, the center voltage sensing terminal and then positive. So notice we have negative, positive, negative, positive, and then down below we have positive, negative, positive, negative. Uh, this whole row going all the way across has the negative on the left. The very bottom row has the positive on the left. Uh, and this other one over here will be uh, a little bit different. And so somehow we need to connect the modules in numerical order together in the proper series uh, configuration. So for that, there's a special bus bar that these uh, batteries uh, come with. Okay, this 
is the bus bar assembly for this right hand battery stack and as you can see it has metal bus bars that will go from one module over to the next jumping the big gap right here and then it has short little ones right here that go up and down to go to change rows to go from one row to the next row and then it also has a whole bunch of little tiny wires here for the center tap on these modules for the voltage sensing uh, between the two terminals and so this harness or this uh, bus bar assembly here made by Yazaki uh, is the one that goes on here it actually snaps in place over these terminals they have a little lip right there and so we will set this down on here for those of you thinking he doesn't have his personal protective equipment or his high voltage gloves on this is not high voltage so uh, a word on on high voltage uh, the federal motor vehicle safety standards define high voltage on an automobile as anything 60 volts dc or higher or 30 volts ac or higher the national fire protection association uh, and the department of energy define it as 100 volts dc or higher uh, for needing personal protective equipment or half of that 50 volts ac for personal protective equipment needs now that these are this is a dc battery so we're below the 100 volts this is a, a 90 volt uh, battery right here uh, because there's confusion between dc and ac voltage levels that are safe i believe that most vehicle manufacturers have picked the 50 volt ac as the rule saying anything above 50 volts you need to have personal protective equipment on well that that's extra safe and i'm not arguing with that it's just that the dc voltage rating is typically almost double of the ac voltage rating for personal protective equipment so i'm i i do have insulated tools right here i'm going to use to put this together but i'm not not going to wear uh, high voltage gloves until we start connecting the 90 volt stack to another 90 volt stack and to the 180 volt stack um, because there's there's no need uh, to do so so the bolt torque on these little tiny bolts that holds each bus bar to the positive or negative terminal is 5.5 newton meters or 49 inch pounds which is less than uh, five foot pounds uh, well it's just a little over four foot pounds so most technicians don't even have a torque wrench that goes to as little as four foot pounds you need to get out an inch pound torque wrench like i used to tighten those bolts down and uh, torque those so i'm going to put these in and then we'll torque them the nuts that i'm tightening these bolts down into are held in place inside of the little plastic pieces coming out of those modules so you don't want to use any type of an electric or uh, impact gun uh, installing these because you can or removing them either because you can break that nut uh, loose inside the plastic all right so i've got all of the bus bar bolts in place uh, and we'll torque those here in just a moment now we need to put in the little screws for the voltage sensing lines and they are torqued to an incredibly low torque <laughs> of 1.2 newton meters or 11 inch pounds which is just one inch pound shy of one foot pound for those of you that uh, speak foot pound rather than newton meters one foot pound of torque 
is too much uh, for the screw. So just a light connection is all they're looking for there. Okay, all the bolts and screws are in. Just need to torque them now. Let's see, it was 49 on the bolts and 11 on the screws. All right, this torque wrench right here goes to, or goes from zero to 30 inch pounds. So we'll do the screws first at the 11 inch pounds. I may have exceeded that just putting them in with a screwdriver. Let's find out. I think I've got the wrong tip. All right, let's try those screws again. Number one, Phillips. 11. 11. So it was a little more than my screwdriver did, but I just put them in real light. Okay, all the screws are tightened to <laughs> the monstrous 11 foot-pounds, or inch-pounds, 1.2 newton meters. All right, now the bolts for the positive and negative connections are at 5.5 .5 newton meters, or 45, or 49 inch-pounds. So I'll switch to a different torque wrench because that one only goes to 30. So this one goes to 75. So I'll set it on, set the pointer on 49 or five and a half Newton meters right in the middle there. And then we'll snug all these up. Okay, all the bolts are tightened. All right, let's take some voltage measurements. If we go from the overall battery negative right here with our meter on DC volts to the stack positive over here, we get 94.2 volts. Uh, I told you before that anything under 100 volts, it, you're not required to wear PPE for by the Department of Energy or the National Fire Protection Association. Uh, but the most of automobile manufacturers want you to wear it at, at 50 volts. I just wanted to show you if I touch the 94 volts right here, it, it does nothing uh, to me. But that's with my body and skin resistance and so on. Um, it's not something I'd recommend that you do. I just wanted to show you that it's, it's, uh, it's a safe voltage uh, in most conditions. All right, so let's put these, or no, let's take some more measurements. So if we go from, let's see, this was battery negative right here. If we just go over to the first bus bar, there's our 7.8 volts for that module. We go over to the second bus bar. Now they added together at 15.68. If we come back to the third, 23 volts. Go clear over here to the fourth, 31. 39. 54. Oh, I skipped one. 47. Then 54. 62. 70. Seventy eight. Eighty six. And finally, ninety four. So it's just in series. We add 7.5 to 7.8 volts a piece. Um, what do we say this was per volt per module? Uh, 
7.8 volts instead of 7.5 so it's slightly charged more than the nominal voltage but not fully charged at the 4.2 volts each by the way if it was fully charged at 4.2 volts each uh, 4.2 per cell there's two sets of cells in each module so that's 8.4 volts per module times the 48 modules that there are so that's fully charged this would be 403.2 volts and if it was 3.2 volts per cell at fully discharged times two parallel cells per module that's 6.4 volts times 48 modules 307 volts 307.2 at uh, fully discharged but you normally don't want to go to fully charged or fully discharged you want to keep it between the 20 percent and 80 percent unless you are on a road trip or just have no choice but to keep driving but, all right well let's get this uh, let's get these covers on oh, it's got an arrow pointing to the front so this is the front of the vehicle over here just like that one down below and one more over here okay so on this module here we have the module negative and the module positive these two 90 volts between them this happens to also be the overall battery negative right there so once again this is our right hand module our left hand module is just like it back here and then our rear module I want to look at next just a little bit okay right here on the end of the rear stack of 24 modules is the lithium ion battery controller this is a computer that monitors the individual cell voltages of all 48 uh, modules it has electrical connections on the side and along uh, the bottom according to the service information and the uh, training guide that I guides that I downloaded it monitors the cell voltages individual cell pair voltages so two for each module um, and the temperature sensors that it has I believe this has four temperature sensors on this early model and later on they added more uh, temperature sensors uh, it controls the cell pair voltage variation so any difference between the two parallel cells two sets of parallel cells inside the module it tries to uh, balance those out it also tries to prevent overcharging, over discharging and overheating of the battery by controlling how much current can come in and go out uh, while driving while charging uh, and so on so now that I've swung this around we can see this rear stack of 24 modules at 7.5 volts each that gives us 180 volts between this overall ba battery positive terminal right here and the other end of the battery module for module 24 right over here 180 volts and so this one when we go to hook up wires to it um, we'll have to wear our personal protective equipment but even though it's a 180 volts total if I come in with the multimeter and we just start right here at overall battery positive guess I better use the positive terminal and we come down to the negative terminal down here 
it's just 7.8 volts for the one module. If I pick a point halfway across over here, let's see where we are right here. There's 102 volts right there. Yeah, let's come over a little bit more. 133 and all the way to the other end. 188.3 volts. So each individual module adds another seven and a half volts. All right, so this has the same type of bus bar and voltage sensing system that we saw on that right hand stack assembly over there. There's nothing special about this as far as um, the bus bars are concerned. It just puts every other module or every module in series with the next one. Oh, let's see, there's some uh, covers that go on this. So it has an up arrow. Up and up. And these all appear to be identical. It does tell us when we removing these that we take off the two outside ones first and then put on uh, the middle, or then take off the middle one, which means we'll put on the center one first. Let's see, up, yeah, up. Right there, maybe. Let's see if that works out over here. Yes. So now we are ready to put these three stacks of modules into that empty battery case. Now, that we're far from finished because that just sets the modules in there. Then we have to connect each module together. We have to have a service plug and a fuse. We have to hook up all the internal uh, wire harnesses for monitoring all of the internal voltages and connect that to the lithium ion battery control computer right here. Uh, this does have a battery heater. Uh, if you have the cold weather package on the 2011, it came standard on 2012. Uh, and above models, I believe, in, uh, unless you live in a, well, at least for certain geographical regions uh, of, the, of the world. All right, now each of these modules to lift them up and put them in the, the battery housing, are, they're very heavy. So there's, there's a hole right here, there's a hole right here in these end brackets. So there are four holes on each of these end brackets for these modules that will use an engine crane to come in and lift those up and set them down in to the battery housing, uh, lower housing itself. So now let me reposition the, the housing and the, get the crane over here and we'll get these hooked up and set in. Okay, I brought our engine crane in. I've got our crane scale turned on so we can see how much each of these module stacks weigh. And so we'll just get these straps hooked up here with these hooks. These straps are rated for 3,200 pounds, the way I have them looped through the hook here. And we're way less than that here, so there's no danger of straps giving way. All right, we'll center the crane the best we can. Take the slack out of the straps. There we go. Push the crane forward just a bit. And lift it up. All right, let me straighten this out just a little bit. There we go. All right, it looks like we're reading 119, no, 120, 120 pounds on the right hand module stack. So now we'll just move this over to the battery tray and set it in on the right hand side with this in the front, the tall section in the front. So this stack is going to go right here, except this is the front 
and that's the front. I need to now nah, we'll just spin the the load around. Bring in the crane. Right there. Start to bring it down slowly. There are some guide studs down inside of the housing here that we'll line that up with once it gets down. Just like that. All right. Let's get this table out of the way for a moment. Let's come in and get the left hand stack next. Okay. We'll center the table a little better under the crane. Scale on this one is reading 119.5 pounds. So let's put that in the battery housing next. Just like that. All right, now we're ready for that rear stack. Okay, we've got our rear stack uh, sitting right here. If we look at the crane scale, we are at 200. 29, 229 pounds, and we were 120 pounds a piece on the side stacks. So 120 plus 120 is 240, plus another 230 gives us 470 pounds of cell stacks. Now, according to the specifications uh, from the Nissan service information, this entire battery pack and housing and everything weighs 660 pounds so there's another 190 pounds of uh, bottom tray upper cover and internal pieces that have to go together now i did measure the bottom tray uh, to see how much it weighed uh, if you look at this uh, photograph here you can see that uh, also, underneath the bottom tray, there is a center of gravity mark. It looks like a almost a little star type compass that you want to position your lifting table underneath because the rear stack, of course, weighs more than the front two stacks <clears throat> or it's, and it's positioned towards the back of the vehicle uh, as well. So you don't want to center your table under the center of the battery as you lower one of these batteries down out of the car, you want to center it under that center of gravity mark. Um, all right, well, let's set this in the, the battery tray and move on. All right, let's bring it down. There's a couple of alignment studs on the back here line it up all right okay we finally have the right hand stack the left hand stack and the rear stack installed in the lower battery tray now we need to install all of the wiring that connects these 
cell stacks together to combine and, and give us in a big series circuit the 360 volts. Uh, we have to have a way to connect to the outside of the battery and run cables to the inverter assembly that drives the electric motor. Uh, we have temperature sensors we have to install. We have battery heaters uh, we have to install. We have the junction block with the uh, positive, negative, and precharge contactor, precharge resistor. Uh, we have some structural supports that go in here, and uh, all of that is coming up next. All right, before we start putting the wire harnesses in and connecting all these module stacks together, we have to bolt down these module stacks to the housing. So there are both nuts and bolts that need to be put on to hold each of these stacks to the lower battery tray. So let me get those installed next. Okay, I've got all the nuts and bolts started. I'm going to use my electric drive gun here to slowly run them down to where they bought them, and then we'll come back around with a torque wrench. Okay, all the big studs and the bolts that hold down these battery stacks are torqued to 9.6 Newton meters or 85 inch pounds, not foot pounds. So we'll get these torqued next. Okay, I've got all the module stacks bolted down with their numerous bolts and studs and uh, we're ready to move on to the battery heater system uh, but there's some brackets that I have to install uh, on the rear battery stack there in order to uh, make room for the uh, battery stack heaters and the wire harness uh, retainers and so on so let me get these brackets installed next so there are four vertical brackets that use the dark colored nuts to be held in place and they go every other set of studs. If I would have been thinking I would have put these brackets on first before putting the battery stack down in the battery tray but I forgot all the brackets all the rest of the brackets that go on here and the ones I just installed have the same tightening torque of 9.6 Newton meters or 85 inch pounds uh, we have to tighten or torque these brackets first before we put on the next brackets. All right, the next bracket we put on is to support the battery heaters on the rear stack that go over the top on both the, the driver's side and the passenger side. It is retained with the light colored nuts rather than the dark ones. Okay, now we have battery heaters to install. There are six, eight of these battery heaters, six of these smaller ones for the two uh, side stacks, the left stack and the right stack, and then two great big ones for the rear stack for a total of eight uh, heaters. So this is the right side stack heater. Notice it has orange wires going to it it is fed power off of the high voltage battery itself. So these are high voltage heaters. So we'll set those in place where they go. Each, 
Each of these heaters has a stud that we have to put a nut on to hold it down. So that was the front heater. This next one here is the center heater. Heater number three. like that. And then we have side stack heaters for the very back of these side stacks. Just like that. And like that. And then for the rear battery stack we have the left and right upper uh, heaters. Uh, kind of an interesting thing about the operation of these heaters. Uh, in the instructor guide and service information that I have access to, it, it says that they don't turn on until a negative 17 Celsius or 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and the purpose of these is to keep the electrolyte in those cell pouches from freezing. So they turn on at uh, 1.4 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and turn off at 14 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so they're not going to feel warm uh, to human touch when they're on, uh, but their job is to just keep that electrolyte from freezing and it uses power from the battery itself. And it does not need to be plugged in for this to work. This will continue uh, working, drawing power from the battery, it's my understanding, until the battery state of charge gets down to 30%. And then at that point, it shuts the heaters off to preserve what little life there is of the battery uh, left. And then if it still gets too cold, it's just going to freeze and damage uh, the battery. So uh, you should always keep your car plugged in, uh, if possible, especially in uh, cold weather. So it's just a resistive element type heater. Uh, we can't really see the, the resistive elements. We just have this aluminum plate that the elements are sandwiched uh, between. So let's, let's take one of these apart and take a look at it. So it's just got a couple of wire ties holding the harness in place. We'll lift that harness up out of there, just like that. So it has two tabs that have to be pressed uh, and released in order for the element to slide out. It's almost a three-handed operation. There we go. Okay, so it just slides over a little bit and then lifts out. Okay, looking at this heater element here, uh, it looks like we have a power wire that comes in and feeds the outside one, the middle one, and the other outside one with uh, battery positive, high voltage battery positive. It looks like the resistive elements all connect together underneath down here electrically. And then the return path are the two wires right here that go back to battery negative. Uh, an interesting uh, little heater element assembly. So the whole element assembly just fits on top of the rear battery stack. As I said before, we have one for the right hand side. like that, and this other one that we took apart uh, for the left-hand side. Okay, let's put this heater element back in the housing. Just bring it in and slide it forward until it stops. And then our harness, get it back where it's supposed to go. Just 
like that. So we will set this right over here on its installation studs. All of these heaters that I just installed, all eight of them, are held down with the light colored uh, 10 millimeter head nuts. So we'll get those installed and torqued to the same 9.6 newton meters or 85 inch pounds. Okay, we've got all the battery heaters uh, bolted down and torqued. And now the next thing to do is bring in the battery heater wire harness. Okay, this is our battery heater wiring harness. And it makes a connection, of course, with every battery heater. It makes a connection up front here where the uh, junction block with the contactors goes because that's where it receives its power after the contactors are enabled and then we have a controller that is going to control the heater that plugs in also so let's get this set in place uh, the power source harness side there's a left and a right side here has to go on the driver's side So I've plugged in our wire harness from the two rear heaters into their brackets. And now we'll bring in the heater harness. And then the supply power for the left and right rear stack heaters. There we go. And then as I said, we have a left-hand side heater harness and a right-hand side heater harness. These have to go in underneath everything else, all the other brackets and other harnesses that we put in here. Um, it's clear down to the very bottom. So we'll have to lift up other harnesses and tuck it down in. It has some little clips, harness clips that hold it in place. Here's one. Here's one. Another one. Then we supply power to the front heater with this connector. Power to the other front heater with this connector. Get our harness clips into their brackets. And we have right hand rear power here to the right hand stack and rear power to the left hand stack. And we've got the center heater with its connector. Plugs in to a bracket clip. On the driver's side, left hand side, and then the center heater connector on the right hand side. Just like that. And plugs into a bracket down below. There we go. All right. So now the only loose harnesses we have are the two control harnesses 
and our voltage sensing harnesses and the power feed for the battery heater. Okay, now that we've got the battery heaters and the heater harnesses all installed, there's a big structural support member that goes left to right, uh, I believe to protect the battery in the event of a side collision. So this goes in after the wire harness for the battery heater. Otherwise you won't be able to get it installed. There's two big studs with nuts to be installed on the outside edge. And four bolts that support it in the middle here. All right, we'll torque these center bolts to the same 9.6 Newton meters. Okay, we'll tighten these two outside nuts on the studs to 25 foot pounds or 33.9 Newton meters. Okay, before we can install the rest of the wire harness, there are some additional brackets that need to be installed here. So let's get those in place. This front one here that I'm installing is for uh, retaining the hybrid or is for retaining the junction block with the contactors in it. So we'll set that right down there. And then we've got another bracket for the rear back here uh, that helps hold wire harnesses in place. Get these bolts torqued to the same 9.6 Newton meters. Okay, next we have one, two, three, four temperature sensors for this entire battery pack. Uh, two of them go in the rear stack and then one on each of the uh, left and right stacks. So let's get those installed. This one measures the temperature of module 44. This rear one measures the temperature of module one, the very end one, and module 12, one right in the middle. Module one, and then module 12, and then just a bunch of clips to hold the harness as we run it all the way over to the end over here where the battery computer is going to plug in. And then the last temperature sensor is for module 27, which is this bottom one here on the driver's side center. Couple of brackets. All right, we have one more part to install now uh, this is the battery heater controller. Uh, it has a contactor, a relay as they call it here, and a little computer processing unit. It has an external interface connection right here with the, the lithium ion battery controller. And then these two brown connectors right here, one of them is the input from the power uh, from the contactors up front, and the other one is the output to all of the heater modules themselves. So this sits right here. Plug in our two 
brown harnesses here. And then it has three nuts that hold it in place. Making sure that we're not pinching any other harnesses underneath it. <laughs> All right, we'll get those torqued in place. Okay, the next thing to install is called the battery junction block. And if I take the cover off of the battery junction block, you can see in here that it has a positive contactor right here, a negative contactor right there. It has a pre-charge contactor right there. It has a pre-charge resistor underneath it with a resistance of 30 ohms. Uh, we have our heater, battery heater power that comes off of this side. We have a current sensor right here that is used by the uh, battery controller uh, for monitoring how much current's going in and out. And then we have a low voltage connection right here connected to the computer that is used to control all three of these uh, contactors and measure the amount of current uh, through this current sensor here. And if you're not familiar with a battery junction block, I've covered this in many of my other videos, but basically what we have on our uh, on the end of the junction block here is we have, let me make sure I got the polarity right, overall battery positive from this entire battery here will connect right here. Overall battery negative will connect right here. Now this positive right here, when we engage the positive contactor, will be connected to this output terminal over here. So right now there is no connection between this side and this side, no connection. But if we turn on that positive contactor, it will connect this side to this side. This is the output that goes on under your car in the big high voltage uh, orange cables up to your inverter assembly that is, and your DC to DC converter and air conditioning driver and everything else. Um, and, but more importantly, to the electric motor uh, to make the vehicle move. On the negative side, the negative contactor right here, when it turns on, connects battery negative on the input side to battery negative on the output side for the inverter as well. So just it's just bigger, looks a little different than other battery junction blocks, but it has the exact same parts. It works the same way. Um, and so we will install that here next. in preparation for the high voltage uh, harnesses to be connected. So there are just four nuts that hold this down on studs. We'll get these torqued to the same torque as the other bolts, the 9.6 newton meters. All right, with the junction block installed, I can now connect the high voltage power connection from the junction block to the battery heater controller. But none of that is live uh, at the moment because there's really no power here at the junction block. Okay, finally, the main harness uh, can be installed. Uh, this end of the main harness connects to the lithium ion battery computer or controller. And the other end connects to all of the voltage sensing lines on the battery module. If you remember, there's that little Phillips head screw in the middle of the two, uh, the, the battery positive and the battery negative terminals on each module. These wires connect to that screw and to one of the positive or the negative uh, terminals on that same module so that it can measure both uh, voltages. So when we start plugging these in, that's when we're plugging in high voltage connections because those are live connected to uh, the battery right now. 
so I'll have to have my uh, personal protective equipment gloves on at that point. Uh, this black portion of the harness is the low voltage harness and it connects to all of the temperature sensors, the heater controller, and the uh, junction block up front that we just uh, connected in, or installed. And then it connects to an external harness that will go out the front of the battery itself. So let's get this in, installed next. All right, we'll plug in our temperature sensors. On the rear here anyway, or in the middle. Rear temperature sensor harness, low voltage. All right, there's one more component I forgot that I could install without high voltage gloves on it at the moment. And this is the front electrical connector. There's two pins right here for the battery, positive and negative. Positive is this terminal, negative is this terminal. Once power is transferred through the contactor, contactors. And this is the low voltage harness connector that connects to this harness right here. This little tiny uh, two terminal connector right here is called the interlock circuit. And it connects right here on this harness. The interlock circuit will detect when someone has unplugged the electrical connector uh, right here without powering down the system properly. And if it detects that, then it automatically shuts off the high voltage uh, contactors, the positive and negative contactors in the junction block to remove power so that you don't get DC arcing as you are unplugging the uh, connector in a possibly live circuit, which is a really bad and dangerous thing to do. So now this is going to stick through the front. So I just installed this and now we've got a, a ground strap right there that we'll install. And then I'm missing four nuts. All right, as you can see, there are four studs right here that are missing nuts. And I'm usually pretty good at keeping things organized. Uh, I couldn't find the nuts. And so one thing that I always do before disassembling anything is to photograph it. Take lots of photographs. And it turns out when this battery arrived, uh, those nuts were missing. They just weren't installed. So um, I've got some other nuts that will do the trick, but they're not the correct nut for the this application, but it's the same thread, so I'll get those installed. I've got to install the two bolts that connect the contactor output to this connector here now. Now we can get everything torqued. Now we can connect this low voltage harness to the output connection. Finally, that was a rough one. And then our interlock circuit connector right there. All right. And then our low voltage control harness from the battery uh, computer to the contactor assembly to control those. All right, I'm ready to get my high voltage lineman gloves on. Um, with the leather outer covering. Uh, this box uh, of gloves I purchased earlier this year, it has a 5 of 19 date on it, and this is 12 of 19. And if you've heard there's a six-month expiration, that's true, but it's only from the day that you opened them and first used them. So 
we actually received them on 829 of 19 and according to OSHA they can sit unused in their box for up to one year before opening them and then you still have six months after that so these are brand new um, Salisbury lineman gloves uh, normally there's an opening you can just slide them right out of there but they seem to be uh, welding the plastic now um, to get the or to keep them in in good shape in storage so very carefully so I don't cut the the gloves or myself I'm going to open that bag it was kind of interesting in the Nissan's uh, service information and the uh, training material uh, in particular they only showed photographs of uh, technicians using these lineman gloves with no leather outer protectors well that's that's against OSHA regulations here in the United States I don't know what the regulations are in Japan if that's where they developed uh, the training but these gloves can be damaged uh, quite easily and I have a separate video on personal protective equipment and how to check uh, high voltage gloves and so on but you just want to inspect them uh, blow them up look look and listen for leaks before you install before you put these on your hands and basically put your life in your own hands uh, every day so I will get these checked and get them on now according to OSHA there's only one exception where you can use the gloves just by themselves and that is if wearing the leather outer protectors uh, makes it too hard to get in and manipulate small parts but it also says once you do that these gloves are no good you have to either replace them or send them out to be recertified not just you doing an inspection but an actual electrical insulation uh, recertification so that's an expensive decision to make so always wear your outer leather protectors as you work on uh, high voltage circuits by the way high voltage in the outside of the automotive world <laughs> is not 400 volts this is considered low voltage these these gloves are rated for 1,000 volts and uh, somebody put a sticker over it but it, they actually say low voltage right on the the box itself so anything less than 1,000 volts but remember I said according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, Federal Motor Vehicle Standard 305 I believe uh, states that high voltage in the automotive world is anything higher than 60 volts DC and 30 volts AC all right well we've talked about that already we are ready to start connecting all of our high voltage sensing lines and then we'll get out the great big battery high voltage battery cables that connect the individual stacks to each other so let's get these voltage sensing lines connected so this harness here is the voltage sensing lines for the 24 rear modules and then that goes right over to the the computer this harness here that I'm going to plug in next is the voltage sensing lines for the right hand stack and then this other harness here is the voltage sensing lines for the left hand stack so all of those are connected now so now we have two great big orange cables these two cables are what connect the overall battery positive on the right rear of the rear stack there all the way up to our contactor assembly and what connects the overall uh, battery negative to the contactor assembly uh, as well through the service disconnect lever that we still have to install here so let's get these two cables installed and 
And then as you can see, this cable will come all the way forward and connect to the input of our uh, contactor assembly here, our junc junction block. But we have to install uh, the service disconnect lever because it's got some harness hold down clips in there that we need to uh, connect as well. So now we'll install this big heavy cable here. This will go from module 24 at the left rear to the service disconnect lever that we have to install next. It is now time to bring in our service disconnect connector and lever right here. The service disconnect connector has two terminals underneath it right here, these two. And when the service lever is installed, it connects this side to this side, or just connects the two together. So we are going to use this to connect to that last cable we just installed, and then another one to connect to the battery. And this, when this lever is removed, creates an open circuit, just like it is right now, inside of the battery, which reduces the overall uh, voltage of the sections. Instead of it being 360 volts at the contactors, uh, it would be zero, but it uh, really divides it into, um, Let's see, it would be a 100, or no, 270 volt section and a 90 volt section is what it would divide it into. All right, the service disconnect lever itself right here, um, I've opened it up, which you're not supposed to do, and it has a 225 amp 450 volt fuse inside of it. So here's the bottom view. And so this goes right in here. Except I may have it backwards. Just clips in place, just like that. The two little tiny terminals right there, that's the another interlock circuit. So if you disconnected this before you were supposed to, the interlock circuit would disconnect first and it would kill the power to the uh, contactors, which would prevent arcing as you remove this, which is why you must wear high voltage uh, gloves when you remove this, just in case there's a live circuit. DC arcing uh, in a live circuit is, is frightening. Uh, there's videos all over YouTube of DC arcing uh, take a look at it. it. It'll make you want to wear your gloves. All right, so I'm going to install the connector, but not the service lever until we're done uh, with everything. Okay, when installing the service disconnect lever connector, we have a bus bar that's going to go from the connector over to module 25. The big harness, the big cable that we just installed, the shorter one, comes from module 24. So remember, everything is in series. So we have module 24 coming in here. It connects to module 25. It's just a big series circuit. But when the service disconnect lever is removed, the, the series circuit is opened. All right, let's see if we can get this cable connected now. Bring that in underneath. Put the rub rubber cover back over it. There we go. And now we can set this straight down and into and over the heater. Get our connection made here at module 25. Looks like we did. So now we can install the nuts that hold that down and the nut for the connection on module 25. 
I forgot to hook up the uh, interlock circuit to the bottom of the connector there. So we got to take that cover or that bracket or take the bracket bolts out just long enough to plug that back in. Okay, let's let's take that out and plug that interlock circuit harness into the service disconnect lever connector. So we'll just lift this back up. This little white connector right here has got to go in and plug in right there. Okay. Now we can put this back in. <laughs> if you leave that interlock connector disconnected, like I accidentally did there, the vehicle would never power up because it would s immediately see there's an open interlock circuit, which should always be closed or a, a big series circuit. And it would never enable the contactors to close. So there would never be any power to the inverter to make the vehicle move. So it's a, very critical uh, circuit. Okay, we're just about done. Um, we have two more bus bars to install to put more battery modules in series with each other to increase the voltage and to connect the overall battery negative terminal over here to our um, contactor assembly here. So I've got so I've got one bus bar that connects module 36 to module 37. 36 is right here on the right so this is going to go across here. Let me get this big cable from battery positive down on the There we go. Okay, so 36 to 37. Right here to right there. And then module 48 to battery negative. So overall battery negative. Looks like I better put it on first. All right, it looks like this bus bar should have gone on before the um, contactors. Would have made it a lot easier. This is not impossible, but it's less than ideal. There we go. Okay, so there's our negative terminal bus bar connected. So now we can connect the rest of these or put the nuts on the rest of the bus bars and get module 36 here connected to module 37. Get those torqued. Get these back ones here as well. And one more to torque right over there. Module 24. Okay, the last internal piece to install is the lithium ion battery controller or computer. And it has all the electrical connections for the voltage sensing uh, circuits, the temperature sensor sensing circuits, the contactors, and the um, interlock circuits, and external communication. Now, the service information warns us that we should always disconnect this first and install it last. 
otherwise damage to the uh, computer can occur. So we connect the high voltage lines first and then the low voltage lines. It has four bolts that hold it in place. Two bolts in the back. Okay, these are only torqued to um, 5.5 newton meters. And then finally, the last two electrical connectors, the low voltage ones for the lithium ion battery controller. And there we go. All right, the last internal piece to install, except I'm not going to install it yet because I, I need it off for demonstrations in my classroom, in my classes, is the junction block cover that covers up the contactors and the electrical connections and, and so on. Uh, but I want to show you uh, the function of the service disconnect lever and the contactors uh, themselves and so let me grab a multimeter okay just a quick word about multimeters uh, they need to be uh, rated category 3 1000 volt for this type of work and a good quality meter a good name brand meter who has had their meter tested and certified by some sort of sort of certification organization such as underwriters laboratory or the Canadian Standards Association or Intertech or, or whomever um, to make sure that this meter is following all of the insulative and personal protective uh, requirements laid out by the International Electrotechnical Committee uh, and that's for your safety. Uh, meter leads wear out over time, the real flexible ones, the, the strands can break and you need to make sure that your meter is clean and in good shape. Uh, you also need to verify that your meter is capable of reading accurately uh, before you bet your life on uh, some sort of a reading that you're or measurement you're going to take uh, on the battery. So for example on these these front two terminals right here it, it's showing zero volts but am I sure that the meter is even working? Am I sure that the uh, leads are in good shape? So the best thing you can do is test it on another battery just a 12 volt battery, 9 volt battery, whatever. Uh, Fluke does sell what's called a proving unit. I've got one of these right here uh, it's part number PRV240 and it will put out around 240 volts DC and AC. There's a switch on the side. I've got it on DC right now. But if I take my multimeter leads and press them down on those two terminals, I should read somewhere around 240 volts depending on the state of charge of the battery in this proving unit. But looking at the screen of my uh, Fluke 87, here we go, 236 volts. So we know that the meter is capable of reading a high voltage, not just 9 volts, not just 12 volts. Um, and, and as I said, this can do AC voltage as well. But we're dealing with DC right here uh, on this battery. So uh, I'm going to switch meter leads or ends of the meter leads to alligator clips. And even the, the tips and ends need to be certified. I have a separate class where we talk about that. So I've got alligator clips and I'm going to put the red clip on the overall battery positive connection right here at the contactor. So right there and then the black alligator clip and meter lead to the overall battery negative. 
side, right there. All right, as you can see, the meter is reading oh, 320 millivolts, uh, thousandths of a volt. So this is less than one volt. So now I'm going to come in with the service disconnect lever and plug it into the connector. And now we should get the 360 or whatever uh, volts proving that the service disconnect lever fuse is good and that it's an open circuit uh, at the moment. So here we go. It's plugged in. We are now reading 376.6 volts at the input side of the contactor with the service plug installed, as you can see there. All right, now I'm going to move these meter leads to the output side of the contactor. And I want you to notice that now the meter, now the meter shows pretty much zero, three millivolts. Uh, no power, no voltage. And that proves that the contactors are open. They're not allowing that 370 whatever volts uh, to be present on the output lines, which means the voltage here on the front of the battery is also zero. So the contactors do a, a good job of opening the, the high voltage circuit there. When we do service work on the vehicle and we want to disable all of that, then we just remove the service plug lever when told to by the appropriate uh, service procedure. Uh, but you don't always do that. There's, there's times that you'll want that uh, plugged in for diagnostics. But the important thing to know is that when you do remove that, it open circuits the inside of the battery and there will be no, or there should be no power on this output. But you should always use a qualified, tested multimeter to verify that there's no power there before uh, you disconnect or any other components or go inside uh, and assume that something is depowered without checking it first. So I'm going to remove the service plug lever, push on a little tab, Rock up and pull. All right, just a couple more things and we're finished. Uh, I want to call to your attention the seal right here around the outer edge of the lower battery tray. This seal on the first versions, the first version 2012 or 11 and 12 of the Nissan Leaf uh, it was designed to, with the upper cover put on, keep out moisture uh, and dirt, dust, whatever. Uh, and it needs to be checked to make sure that it is sealed properly. So right here on the front of the battery is an air leak check plug. And what you do is you take this plug out. This plug has a gasket on it. A, a copper gasket, just like an oil drain plug or, or whatever, transmission drain plug. Come on, these gloves are slowing me down. Okay, so there is the air leak check plug. And there's a special service tool that you screw into there with the cover on and all the bolts torqued down. There's a proper tightening sequence. Uh, for that upper cover. And then you connect compressed air to it through a special low pressure regulator that limits the maximum pressure to uh, two kilopascals, which is the same as 0 0.23 PSI, pounds per square inch. Extremely small amounts of pressure. And so you're supposed to pressurize it uh, then block off the air pressure and it should not drop below 0 0.2 uh, PSI. If it does, then you've got a leak uh, somewhere and you need to go double check your gasket and so on. On the 2013 and later models, they got rid of this gasket and went to a urethane adhesive that you have to cut to remove the upper cover and then clean it all up and reseal it uh, when you go back together. But all 
electric vehicle batteries that I've seen that are mounted under the vehicle or outside of the passenger compartment have some sort of a leak check procedure. The General Motors products pump uh, evaporative emission tester smoke in and you look for a, a, a smoke leaking out and then you flush it all out with nitrogen uh, when you're done. Uh, I don't know what Tesla has on theirs uh, because it's it's not a user serviceable battery but I'm sure they have some sort of a leak check uh, procedure as well uh, just to make sure that the entire battery is sealed. Uh, you, it, it, if you don't keep it sealed then water and, and dust and everything else will get in which can cause electrical short circuits and malfunction computers and, and all kinds of uh, problems you don't want to have uh, inside of a battery. So the, one of the last things you do is make sure that it holds pressure verifying that it is uh, properly sealed. All right, this has been a, a really long video, a big long service procedure of putting one of these back together. Uh, almost anybody can take one apart, uh, big deal. Just take the bolts out and start pulling and, and tearing and so on. But putting it back together and having it work uh, when you're done is a different story. And it's, it's critical that you follow the proper service information and torque bolts, especially the electrical uh, connection bus bar and, and cable bolts so that we don't get any uh, poor connections which end up causing unwanted resistance and unwanted heat, melded connections, possible fires, and so on. All right. Well, uh, once again, I'd like to uh, thank Green Tech Auto Hybrid uh, Batteries for letting us uh, have them play with this battery here uh, this year. I uh, greatly appreciate that. And I appreciate you uh, as viewers in watching and supporting this channel. Thank you for watching and have a good day.